New questions about how one of America's bigger banks failed and what's being done to avoid contagion. Fear also spreading from Wall Street to Main Street. Look at this. Trading was halted on at least 20 regional banks after shares fell by as much as 80 percent. The federal government stepped in overnight, backstopping the failed banks in California and New York. But worries persist that other smaller regional banks also could have similar issues. Several were battered in early trading outside Silicon Valley Bank's main branch today in Santa Clara. We're here to protect you guys. Federal officials greeted bank customers lined up to get access to their money. SVB customers tell me what frustrates them is the lack of clarity on exactly how much money they'll have access to and when. This line has been growing since before the bank opened this morning, some traveling from as far as Australia. SVB had more than $200 billion in assets with investments in long-term treasury bonds whose value plummeted as interest rates went up, causing the run on the bank. Exposed were companies like Roku, Pinterest, and Roblox, but also small family-owned businesses like StrongSuit in Ohio. We're getting access to the capital that we have in, in SVP today, and we're already taking action to, to move those dollars, and we're being you know, very thoughtful about the, the types of partners that we want to work with moving forward. Americans can rest assured that our banking system is safe. Your deposits are safe. Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. So President Biden says that everything is fine, your deposits are safe. But after the failure of three banks in less than a week in the USA, is that really true? If everything is now fine and dandy, why have the stock markets reacted so badly to the failure of these banks? We've seen bank shares being hammered over the course of the last few days, and it's likely that that's going to continue over the course of the next few days and weeks. So in today's video, I'll have a look at the support scheme that the Federal Reserve has announced with regards to customers' deposits with banks. We'll then have a look at some data which compares the current level of deposits that banks are holding with the level of loans and securities that various banks are holding. So this is really looking at the availability of cash that those banks have. We'll then have a look at some data which takes account of unrealized losses that banks are sitting on right now and what the impact of those losses would be on their capital ratios. We'll go on to look at six banks in the USA that Moody's, the rating agency, has now downgraded because they consider them to be higher risk. We'll have a look at what's going on with international banking giant Credit Suisse, which has had a number of problems over the last few years and concerns are rising about their liquidity situation. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next few weeks and whether or not there's a rising risk of more bank failures. Today, thanks to the quick action of my administration over the past few days, Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. And their hardworking employees can breathe easier as well. No losses will be, and I'm on, this is an important point, no losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Let me repeat that. No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Instead, the money will come from the fees that banks pay into the deposit insurance fund. The management of these banks will be fired. If the bank is taken over by FDIC, the people running the bank should not work there anymore. Investors in the banks will not be protected. They knowingly took a risk, and when the risk didn't pay off, investors lose their money. That's how capitalism works. So as you've just heard from Joe Biden, the USA has introduced a new support scheme to protect all depositors in the event of the failure of their bank. And this action was brought on directly by the failure of Silicon Valley Bank on Friday the 10th of March and the subsequent failure on Sunday the 12th of March of Signature Bank. The additional funding offered to banks will be made available through the creation of a new bank term funding program, which offers loans of up to one year in lend to banks, saving associations, credit unions, and other eligible depository institutions, pledging US treasuries, agency debt, mortgage-backed securities, and other qualifying assets as collateral. These assets will be valued at par, and the loans offered will be an additional source of liquidity against high-quality securities, eliminating an institution's need to quickly sell those securities in times of stress. The Department of Treasury will make available up to $25 billion from the Exchange Stabilization Fund as a backstop. However, the Federal Reserve does not anticipate that it will be necessary to draw on these backstop funds. So what does all of that mean and why has this facility been structured in this way? If you've been following the channel, you'll know that the failure of both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank 
wasn't down to the fact that those banks didn't have enough assets to cover their liabilities. They actually had plenty of assets. The problem that both of those banks had was that they'd been investing their customer deposits into government securities and bonds over the course of the last few years. And because of the rapid rise in interest rates that we've seen over the last 12 months, all of those bonds were out of the money because there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and the price of bonds. And because both banks experienced a run where their customers demanded all of their money was returned, they had to start selling those bonds in order to generate cash to pay back their customers. And due to the fact that the bonds were trading below par, the sale of those bonds crystallized losses. And when Silicon Valley Bank announced that it had lost more than a billion dollars, it caused even more customers to withdraw their money. And the problem spiraled out of control to the point where the bank collapsed. So what this scheme from the Federal Reserve does is allow any bank that needs cash to be able to get a loan against its bonds at par. So it doesn't matter if that bond is currently trading at a discount to its face value because you can borrow 100% of the long-term value of that bond. And the logic behind this scheme is that as long as a bank has net assets, so the value of its bonds are worth more than the customer deposits, it can now access that cash by taking it from the Federal Reserve as a loan and use that cash to repay some of the customer deposits. So theoretically, if this facility had been available to Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, they could have survived the bank run by taking loans from the Federal Reserve. But when you look at the details of this scheme, the fundamental flaw in the design is that there is only $25 billion that's been set aside to fund these loans. At the time of its failure, Silicon Valley Bank had around $175 billion of customer deposits. And the problem that the bank was facing was that it wasn't just a small percentage of the customers who wanted to remove their money. Word had spread throughout the whole of the tech community that the bank was in trouble. And that resulted in a high percentage of the customers trying to move large amounts of capital out of the bank electronically. And as we discussed in other videos, bank runs today do not have people queuing around the block looking to take out large amounts of cash. This is all done online. Companies can simply access their accounts electronically and move the funds away in a matter of seconds. So a bank run can gather pace really, really quickly. You can see billions of dollars disappearing in minutes. And when you put the $25 billion facility that the Federal Reserve has just approved into the context of $175 billion in deposits in one bank, Silicon Valley Bank, there is a real possibility that this facility could run out very, very quickly. And it's currently estimated that US banks have in excess of $1 trillion in unsecured deposits. And just as a reminder, $1 trillion is $1,000 billion. So a facility of $25 billion represents around 2.5% of the total amount of unsecured deposits that are currently sitting in US banks. This chart looks at the loan to deposit ratio for a variety of different US banks. The scale on the left hand side shows the percentage of the bank's deposits that are from retail customers, so not from corporates. And the scale across the bottom shows the percentage of loans and securities as a percentage of deposits. And the dots on this chart plot the risk profile of the different banks. So in terms of assessing that risk, the top left hand corner of this graph would represent the lowest risk because that would represent a higher percentage of retail depositors. And retail depositors are seen as being lower risk because they hold smaller balances. And so it's less likely that all of those depositors will move all of their money at the same time. If you've got a higher percentage of corporate depositors who have large balances of tens or hundreds of millions, it's relatively easy for those corporates to move all of that capital at the same time, as happened with Silicon Valley Bank, when all of the tech terms and the VC backed companies were told to move their money. And in terms of the scale across the bottom, it's obviously better to have a higher percentage of your assets in cash or short term assets that you can realize quickly to be able to release customer funds. The higher percentage of your deposits that you've tied up into loans and bonds means that they're less liquid. And if you're forced to sell those securities in the market, then you may have to do that at a loss and therefore you're crystallizing losses at the same time as you're losing deposits. And that's obviously bad news for any bank. So going back to the risk ratio, the best possible scenario for any bank here would be top left hand corner of this chart. And the worst possible scenario is bottom right hand corner. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner, the bank with one of the worst percentage of retail deposits and one of the highest percentages of loans and securities was Silicon Valley Bank. And slightly to the left of Silicon Valley Bank is Signature Bank, both of which have failed over the course of the last week or so. 
But the reason I wanted to show this chart is really to highlight the fact that there are a number of other banks that have similar characteristics and therefore are running the risk of hitting liquidity problems. And I'll just pick out a few of these banks, the majority of which have been downgraded by Moody's recently. And so we'll go into a bit more detail later in the video as to what's happening with those banks. If we start on the far right hand side of this chart, which indicates the highest percentage of customer deposits that are tied up in loans and securities, you can see that the bank that has the highest percentage is Key Corp, followed by First Republic Bank, Western Alliance and Huntington. If we now look at the other axis of this chart and look at those institutions that have less than 40% of their depositors from retail customers, you can see that this group also includes First Republic Bank and Western Alliance, as well as Comerica and interestingly Citibank. This chart looks at the common equity tier one capital ratio for a variety of different banks and includes an adjustment in that ratio to take account of unrealized losses. So that adjustment has been applied to assets such as bonds that are currently out of the money. And the tier one common capital ratio is a measurement of a bank's core equity capital compared with its total risk weighted assets and signifies a bank's financial strength. So if we look at the blue columns on this chart first, you can see that at the end of Q4 2022, the bank with the highest tier one capital ratio was JP Morgan, followed by Citibank. Third was Silicon Valley Bank, followed by Bank of America, Wells Fargo, M&T, City Federal Reserve, Comerica, Zion, Regions Financial, Huntington, Fifth Third, PNC, Key Corp, Truist, and US Bank Corp. But if we now look at the brown columns on this chart, you can see that the unrealized losses have had a big impact on the capital ratio for a variety of different banks. Obviously, the biggest impact has been on Silicon Valley Bank. When you look at the official tier one capital ratio, Silicon Valley Bank was ranked as the third safest bank in America. However, the adjusted ratio shows the massive impact that the unrealized losses on the bond portfolio had on the business and led to its downfall. So if we look at which other banks have been heavily impacted, we've got Truist, US Bank Corps, Zion, Key Corps, Bank of America, Huntingdon, Fifth Third, PNC, Comerica, Regions Financial, Wells Fargo, and Chicago Federal Reserve. As a result of the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, Moody's, the rating agency, has downgraded six US regional banks, which means that Moody's believes that the risks have increased for these institutions. And I'll run through the list of these six banks in alphabetical order. Comerica Bank was founded in 1849, is headquartered in Dallas, and has 479 branches. The bank currently has $87 billion worth of assets, of which $77 billion are customer deposits, and its current loan book is around $51 billion, which represents around two-thirds of the customer deposits. Moody's have placed all long-term ratings and assessments of the bank on review for downgrade, and have stated that this action reflects Comerica's high reliance on more confidential, sensitive, unsecured deposit funding, its high amount of unrealized losses in its available for sale securities portfolio, as well as a relatively lower level of capitalization. Although Comerica's proportion of market funding as a percentage of tangible banking assets is moderate, its market funding has increased over the last year. Comerica's share of deposits, which are above the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's insurance threshold, is material, making the bank's funding profile more sensitive to rapid and large withdrawals from depositors. In addition, if it were to face higher than anticipated deposit outflows, the bank could need to sell assets, thus crystallizing unrealized losses on its AFS securities, which as of the end of 2022, represented a sizable 38.5% of its common equity tier one capital. First Republic Bank was founded in 2010 and is headquartered in San Francisco. The bank currently has assets of around $198 billion, of which 166 billion are customer deposits, and it has loans outstanding of 151 billion, which represents around 91% of the customer deposits. Moody's have placed all long-term ratings and assessments of the bank on review for downgrade. As a result of the bank's high reliance on more confident, sensitive, uninsured deposit funding, its high amount of unrealized losses in its available for sale and held to maturity securities portfolios, as well as a lower level of capitalization relative to its peers. The share of deposits above the FDIC insurance threshold is material, making the bank's funding profile more sensitive to rapid and large withdrawals from depositors. In addition, if it were to face higher than anticipated deposit outflows and liquidity backstops proved insufficient, the bank would need to sell assets, thus crystallizing unrealized losses, which as of the end of 2022 represented 37.7% of its common equity tier one capital. Such crystallization of losses, if it were to happen, could materially weigh on the bank's profitability in capital, which at the end of December were modest compared to peers, with a return on assets of 0.78%, 
and a tangible common equity over risk-weighted asset ratio of 9.1%. Moody's also noted that in February 2023, First Republic issued around 400 million in common equity. Interest Bank was founded in 1876 and has 46 branches. It currently has assets of $7.2 billion, of which 6.5 are customer deposits, and its loan book is $3.6 billion, which represents around 55% of its total deposits. For Interest Bank, Moody's have actually downgraded both the long-term and the short-term rating. However, it's notable that the available for sale securities portfolio represented a sizable 91% of the common equity tier one capital at the end of December 2022. Crystallization of the losses in this portfolio, if it were to happen, could materially weigh on the bank's capital and profitability, Interest capital measured by its tangible common equity over risk-weighted assets was 8.04% at the end of December, which is weaker than its peers. And its common equity tier 1 capital ratio in the same date was 9.6%. UMB Bank was founded in 1902, is headquartered in Kansas City, and has 134 branches. It currently has total assets of $37 billion, of which $32 billion are customer deposits, and the bank has $19 billion of loans outstanding, which represents around 60% of the customer deposits. Moody's have placed on review for downgrade all long-term ratings for the bank. Moody's have noted that the risk-weighted ratio is relatively sound at 10.5%. However, the return on assets at less than 1% is relatively modest compared to peers. Western Alliance Bank was founded in 2003, is headquartered in Phoenix, and has 43 branches. It currently has assets of around $66 billion, of which $54 billion are customer deposits and loans outstanding of $51 billion, which represents around 94% of all deposits. Moody's have placed both the long-term and short-term ratings for Western Alliance on review for downgrade and have noted that at the end of 2022, uninsured deposits were 58% of total deposits. However, to counter this, Western Alliance announced on the 13th of March 2023 that it had boosted its cash reserves by more than $25 billion. The available for sale and held to mature securities portfolios represent 21% of its common tier one capital. Zions Bank was founded in 1873, is headquartered in Salt Lake City, and has 478 branches. It has total assets of $88 billion, of which customer deposits are $79 billion and loans outstanding of $52 billion, which represents around 66% of customer deposits. Moody's have placed all long-term ratings on review for downgrade and have noted that the AFS and HTM securities portfolio represent 51% of its common equity tier one capital. Moody's have also noted that the bank's profitability and capital are modest compared to its peers, with a return on assets of 1.01% and a risk-weighted asset ratio of 8.9%. It's another horrible consecutive net loss for the business, both on the fourth quarter and the full year. Um, can you promise shareholders that you've now closed that door, no more losses from this business? Look, we said this is a two to three years um, transformation. We also said end of October last year, um, we would unfortunately expect a loss in 2023, whilst we are going through the transformation further. And from there on, we will getting profitable. What about the outflows? I think the, the market may take the loss because they know that that was telegraphed well in advance, but the outflows look extraordinary. What does that tell you about the loss of confidence now in the bank? So, A, the outflows um, are not, not, not a surprise if you look at the update which we gave in November. Credit Suisse, which was founded in Switzerland in 1856 and is regarded as one of the nine bulge bracket banks on Wall Street, alongside Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Citigroup, Barclays, Deutsche and fellow Swiss banking giant UBS. Credit Suisse has encountered a series of problems and losses over the last few years. In February, the bank announced a net loss for 2022 of more than $7 billion, which was its worst performance since the banking crisis of 2008 and led to an announcement that it was scrapping its annual bonus scheme for top executives. Less than a week ago, the bank was forced to delay the release of its annual report after the US Securities and Exchange Commission raised last-minute queries relating to cash flow statements from 2019 and 2020. And Credit Suisse has now announced that it's found material weaknesses in its internal controls over financial reporting and said it has not yet stemmed customer outflows. 
A statement reads, as of the 31st of December 2022, the group's internal control over financial reporting was not effective and for the same reasons, management have reassessed and reached the same conclusion regarding December the 31st, 2021. On Tuesday the 14th of March, the bank announced that outflows of cash have stabilised to lower levels but have not yet reversed. As a result of this announcement, the bank shares fell by 5% and are now trading close to an all-time low. Russ Mould Investment Director AJ Bell said that while the immediate fallout from the Silicon Valley bank collapse may have been contained, the edginess around the banking sector isn't helped by the latest revelations from Credit Suisse. It may have been a technical issue according to the Swiss bank, but in the current environment and given the company's recent sketchy track record, investors were hardly in a forgiving mood. In late 2022, the bank disclosed that it was seeing significantly higher withdrawals of cash deposits, non-renewal of maturing time deposits, and net asset outflow at levels that substantially exceeded the rates incurred in the third quarter of 2022. The bank saw customer withdrawals of more than 110 billion Swiss francs in the fourth quarter, as a string of scandals, legacy risk, and compliance failures continued to plague it. Credit Suisse acknowledged that these circumstances have exacerbated and may continue to exacerbate liquidity risks. The reduction in assets under management is expected to result in reduced net interest income and recurring commission and fees, in turn affecting the bank's capital position objectives. A recent report stated a failure to reverse these outflows and to restore our assets under management and deposits could have a material adverse effect on our results of operations and financial condition. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because there's been a lot of excitement in the last seven days. We have seen three US banks fail. And just to remind everybody, because I get a lot of comments saying, who are the three banks? I can't remember. The first bank was Silvergate, which was the bank that was banking a lot of the cryptocurrency markets. The second bank was Silicon Valley Bank, which was specializing in providing banking services to the venture capital community. And the third bank was Signature Bank, which has also been mistakenly referred to as a crypto bank in the mainstream media. However, only around 14% of all of its assets were related to the corporates from the crypto markets. So the failure of these three banks has caused a lot of excitement in the financial markets. And we've seen bank and financial share prices crashing as the markets become nervous that there will be more bank runs and more failures. Now, because the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank happened during the weekend, the Fed was able to put a scheme in place that enabled all of the depositors to get access to all of their cash. And Joe Biden has come out and stated that everybody's deposits are now fully protected, which isn't really the situation. Because as we've seen in today's video, over $1 trillion of customer deposits in the USA are actually uninsured. So the scheme that's been put in place is a loan scheme. It's designed to enable banks that are having liquidity problems to access cash on a short-term loan basis to be able to pass that cash through to the customers. But as we discussed earlier, the problem with that scheme is that there's only been $25 billion set aside to fund it. And that's obviously nowhere near the potential maximum losses of over $1 trillion. However, this scheme has really been put in place to calm everybody down, to allay everybody's fears that all of the banks are going bust tomorrow, and therefore to stop everybody from trying to take all of their cash out of their bank. And as we've discussed in other videos, the banking sector relies on confidence and trust. When you hand over your life savings to your bank, you believe that you'll be able to withdraw those life savings at any point in the future. Your confidence in that financial institution enables you to sleep at night. As soon as you start thinking that maybe your bank hasn't got enough cash to be able to give you your money back, that's when the problems start. And that's exactly what's happening in the world of finance right now. Because of the recent failures and the news reports that everybody's seen about companies and individuals not being able to access their cash, everybody is now nervous that their bank could be at risk. And the purpose of today's video is really to share with you some data and information on some of the other institutions. And as we've seen today, there are other institutions that have similar ratios and similar situations to the banks that have failed. The reason that Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failed, it wasn't because of bad debts or financial engineering or fraud, which are some of the most common reasons why banks have failed in the past. It was mainly down to the fact that their customers became nervous that they couldn't get their money out. And so everybody tried to start withdrawing their full balances out of their accounts. And that led to a bank run. And therefore, those banks were declared insolvent. And that is a very real risk that's currently hanging over every single financial institution in the world. Because there are very few banks and financial institutions that have ready cash available to be able to give it all out to their customers. 
most of their capital is tied up in longer term assets such as bonds and loans and they are illiquid and if you are forced to sell those assets generally speaking that will be at a loss and so the bank will then start incurring losses at the same time as it's losing assets and those circumstances do generally lead to some sort of collapse. So the overall summary from today's video is that a scheme has been put in place in the USA to be able to prevent future bank failures. And to a certain extent, that will work on an individual basis. However, if we see multiple financial institutions facing a run at the same time, or one of the larger institutions gets itself into difficulty, the $25 billion that have been set aside won't last very long, and we will be back in the same situation where we could have failing banks. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, found it useful, informative, and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. And thank you so much for watching this video all the way through to the end. And as usual, here is a special treat.